A woman wearing a mask who claims to be Dr. Deborah Birx, but let's face it, could be anybody, recently commented on the current surge in the Chinese flu, or the Wu flu, or the Kung flu, or the Shai Kam flu, or the Andrew Cuomo death bug, as it is known among terrified New York old people. The alleged Dr. Birx, who claims to be the White House coronavirus response coordinator, but may not even be Dr. Birx, let alone the White House coronavirus response coordinator, said, quote, and this is a real quote. She said, only we can save us from the current surge and we know precisely what to do, unquote. When reporters asked the putative Dr. Birx to elaborate on what precisely we precisely know precisely to do, she said, quote, we must wear the masks we didn't have to wear, but now should wear, though they won't protect us if they're worn beneath the nose or above the mouth or over the face, though they may protect your grandmother, who of course is already dead if she lives in New York State. Then we must shut restaurants unless they're serving rich people and stop celebrating any holiday that suggests there is a spiritual power in the universe higher than your local public officials. Those who are already ill must die alone in order to discourage others from going outdoors where there is no danger of catching the virus unless you're indoors and wearing a mask, which would be useless in that situation. Everyone must stay at home except those delivery people who have to bring us our food while we move large amounts of cash into each other's bank accounts via Zoom conference calls and, of course, governors who need a night on the town. If we precisely follow these precise instructions to perform what we know precisely are the precisely correct actions, we will die like flies, but at least the economy will collapse, unquote. So thank you, Dr. Birx, if that's who you really are. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky dee doo Ship-shaped, ipsy-topsy, the world is a bitty zing It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray, it makes me want to sing Oh, hurrah, hooray, oh, hooray, hurrah Hooray, hurrah, the vast right-wing conspiracy known as Clavenon is back and, and... This is Tuesday, right? So it's only one day away from the mailbag when all your problems will be solved. It's simple. All you have to do is go on dailywire.com slash subscribe and subscribe. That's why it says subscribe. It's a clue. It's a little clue. Follow that clue and subscribe to Daily Wire. Then you can hit the podcast page, go to the Andrew Claven podcast, hit the little mailbag symbol there and ask me anything you want to ask me. You can ask me about religion. You can ask me about politics. You can ask me about your personal life. All my answers are guaranteed 100% correct and will change your life. Will they change your life for the better, you ask? Stop asking me hard questions. Jeez, you know, come on. Uh, you know, and by the way, a lot of people send me these personal questions through the mail to me directly. I can't do that. I can't answer them, but I can answer them on the mailbag. So that's where you want to be. Also, you want to be on my YouTube channel, the Andrew Claven YouTube channel. We already have uh, over 200,000 subscribers. We're trying to get that down to about 35 people who are just the inner circle, you know, the people who really understand what I'm talking about uh, and also believe that they are in communication with the spirit world or possibly Venus. Uh, if you leave a comment there and the comment is sufficiently <laughs> incomprehensible, it will become part of this program. A seamlessly will seamlessly fit into this program. For instance, here is one today from Marcos Carmona, who says, <laughs> this show is like tripping over your cordless phone while talking to nobody on the other line. You're lying down and wondering, how did I get here? I have no idea what that comment means, <laughs> so it just fits right in with everything else I'm saying because I have no idea what else I'm saying either. So today, I'm going to teach you a horrible novelist trick. You are going to absolutely hate this, and the worst thing about this is like not only will it make your life worse, but you won't be able to stop doing it. This, this is true. This is an actual thing that novelists do in order to track the way that people actually think and the way that they deceive themselves, because we all deceive ourselves and we all are dishonest, and you want to write characters who are real characters and actually say and think and do the things that characters do in real life. So the way we do that, novelists pay very close attention 
to their own thoughts and emotions and watch how they lead themselves astray. This is true. I mean, it drives my wife crazy. I pay very close attention to the way I think because it tells me the way other people think and especially the way they lie to one to themselves because we all lie to ourselves. So this helps us write characters honestly, and you can try this at home. Just follow your own emotional reactions very closely. Pay attention to the way you feel and react to what I'm about to say. Here we go. Get ready, all right? This is... Stupid knowledge trick. You'll never forgive me for teaching you this trick. One of the reasons it's important not to spend too large a percentage of your time on politics is that by its very nature, politics creates inside you an atmosphere of crisis. The job of politicians is theoretically to solve problems, and they have to get people to focus on the problems they want to be focused on. And the only way to get people to focus on problems in this crowded world is to pretend that they're crises. That's how you get people hysterical and panicky, and then they pay attention to your crisis, which is helpful to you, for you to address. So if we're always listening to political people, we always feel we're in a crisis. Now, the definition of a crisis, okay, the definition of a crisis is a condition of instability or danger that will lead to a decisive change for the worst, if not dealt with. In other words, if we don't do something right away, things could get desperately bad. Now, things that are not crises, include climate change, racism, and pornography. These are not crises. Now, if you're using your new novelist skills, you may notice that you agreed with me up until I said the word pornography, right? And then you said, well, wait a minute, pornography, that's actually a crisis, right? How did I know that? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a <laughs> spectacular <laughs> trick? How did I know that? Well, the reason that you think pornography is a crisis and you don't think climate change and racism are, are crises is because the left uses climate change and racism to work up their base so they can seize power. So they're constantly saying, oh, it's a crisis. We have the right to riot in Los Angeles and Portland uh, because it's racism is a crisis or climate change. We've got to take over the government because it's climate change. The right uses hatred of pornography to display virtue. We talk about this to display sexual virtue. So we dismiss climate change and racism because that's their crises. But we feel no, pornography is in fact a crisis. But in fact, climate change, racism, and pornography, they're all bad things. If we believe that climate change is a thing, I actually believe there's some climate change due to human uh, enterprise. These are all bad things, but they have something else in common too. They've all been with us forever, and they're not going to go away anytime soon, no matter what we do about them. They should all be addressed. They should all be restrained. But hysteria is not going to change anything because they're not crises. They're steady state of human corruption <laughs> and disorder. All right. Now, keep this novelist trick going as I tell you something else. It's not a crisis. It is not a crisis that Donald Trump lost the election. That's not a crisis. Again, it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. I wanted him to win. I was desperately hoping for him to win. I was praying for him to win. It's a bad thing that he lost, but it's not a decisive turning point for the worse. It's not, oh, we have to do something about this or the country's going to fall off the table. That's not the way it happens because people win and lose elections. Sometimes the people you want to win, win. Sometimes the people you want to win, lose. That's not a crisis. If we can calm down and wake up and see it, we are poised for great conservative victories. A doddering old man and a corrupt termagant have been elected president and vice president. Their worst policies have already been soundly rejected by the electorate, and many of their other ideas have been rendered obsolete by what was the most effective and successful one-term presidency in memory, the presidency of Donald Trump. He has changed everything. We're not going back to coddling Iran. I know they think we are. But the Middle East in which that stupid plan was put in place is gone because you guessed it of Donald Trump. We're not going back to appeasing China, socialist health care, Green New Deals. I could be wrong, but I don't think any of that's happening. Trump has exposed the U.N., he's exposed the media, and he's exposed the radicals among the Democrats. They are all in positions of weakness. If we can just get our minds out of crisis mode and take care of business, we can destroy the left for a generation right now. Win Georgia, build the the culture, build the news business, an alternative news business, fearlessly address and repel the racist anti-American trash being stuffed down people's throats through large corporations and universities. This is the slow and steady work that needs to be done, and it can be done. If we don't turn our minds to it, then the only real crisis is us. 
Well, I know you know it is always important to stay hydrated. I have a big problem with this. I just don't drink enough water, and then I suddenly get really, really tired. So you got to keep that water flowing. But also, of course, this is the time when you want your immune system to be particularly strong, obviously. When you're pushing your body hard or feeling run down, it's important to take care of yourself with the proper vitamins and nutrients. So now Liquid IV has a hydration multiplier plus immune support. It will help maintain and strengthen your immune system while helping you stay hydrated. Hydration multiplier plus immune support is a cutting edge blend of vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, and well immune inconvenient uh, single serving packets. All that stuff really important. I take it all. Vitamin C is well known to help protect your body and support good health. Vitamin D facilitates immune system function and improves your daily defense. People are talking about vitamin D a lot. It's all important stuff. Liquid IV's new hydration multiplier plus immune support is available at Walmart, or you can order online and get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code Claven at checkout. That's 25% off anything you order when you use promo code Claven at Liquid IV. V.com. Get better hydration today, plus support your immune system with liquidiv.com, promo code Claven. The first, you'll just have this energy. You'll say, how do you spell Claven? And it'll be K-L-A-V-A-N, just there the same as when you felt well. <laughs> I want to just talk about more about this, about where, you know, identifying the crisis, what's really going on, and taking a look at the situation we're in. Let's talk about, first of all, the election. Today is Safe Harbor Day. Do you know this? I don't know if people know this or not. This is a federal Safe Harbor date for this is when the states are supposed to certify the results of their election. This means that in terms of the federal government, as, as far as the federal government is concerned, uh, that means their certifications are now the certifications. Now, this is Safe Harbor Day, but in fact, it, next Monday, December 14th, is when the Electoral College actually casts its votes in each state, and that's when the election is actually over. And some would say, well, it's not even over until January 6th, uh, when Congress officially counts the election results. But it's over, okay? It is over. Now, I want you to cast your mind back. This is another uh, part of the terrible novelist trick, is paying attention, not only paying attention to how you feel about things and how your feelings affect what you actually think, but it's thinking back, remembering how you felt about something and then reflecting on how that's affecting you now. I want to play something for you that I, I'm probably the only person who actually remembers this, but after Donald Trump was elected in 2016, celebrities are guides to moral truth and moral action. You know, we, I, I think we all, I think we can all agree on this, that when we want to know what to do, we turn to celebrities and interrupt their fourth or fifth marriage. Uh, and it, while they're taking, driving their kids to rehab, and ask them, what is the moral thing to do? After Donald Trump was elected, a group of celebrities made one of their hilariously self-unaware, self-serious videos, begging the Electoral College not to confirm the election. I'm going to play a minute of you. Think back to the way you, if you remember, how you felt when you actually saw this. It's an amazing piece of work. This is cut eight. Republican members of the Electoral College, this message is for you. As you know, our founding fathers built the Electoral College to safeguard the American people from the dangers of a demagogue and to ensure that the presidency only goes to someone who is to an eminent degree endowed with the requisite qualifications. An eminent degree. Someone who is highly qualified for the job. The Electoral College was created specifically to prevent an unfit candidate from becoming president. There are 538 members of the Electoral College. You and just 36 other conscientious Republican electors can make a difference by voting your conscience on December 19th and thereby shaping the future of our nation. I'm not asking you to vote for Hillary Clinton. I'm not asking you to vote for Hillary Clinton. I'm not asking you to vote for Hillary Clinton. As you know, the Constitution gives electors the right to vote for any eligible person. Any eligible person, no matter which party they belong to. <laughs> I, always love, I always love the celebrities, how they repeat things with a serious face because you're just too stupid to get it the first time. So they have to say an eminent, he's qualified to an eminent degree, an eminent degree because you, didn't, you just, you know, you're a Republican. You're just too stupid to understand what there's. And then the soulful piano music all makes it true because uh, now I want you to think back to how you felt when you saw that. If you remember 
I remember quite well that what I thought was that is the stupidest thing I have ever seen. And yet, deep down in my heart, there was a little tremor of anxiety that it just might work. It was about, a, you know, I just thought it was about a, a 0.1% uh, possibility it just might work. But it's a little tremor of anxiety. And then, of course, when the electors completely ignored it, as, of course, they should, uh, when the electors completely ignored it, I thought like, oh, of course, that was ridiculous. But there was also just that little thing way, way down deep in my stomach where I thought, Whew, I'm glad that didn't work. That's not going to work now either. None of that's going to happen now either. People telling you that the electors aren't going to matter, that the safe harbor day isn't going to be the safe harbor day. It's not going to matter now either. And they, you, you may have a little tremor where you had that tremor of anxiety before. You may have a little tremor of hope. Forget about it. OK, so, you know, President Trump is said to have called the speaker of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives and asked him to uh, reverse the loss in the state. And he said to uh, actually they've confirmed some of this, that he asked Michigan to reverse the um reverse the results. None of that's going to happen. Right now, there are three lawsuits in place that are kind of interesting. They're not going to do anything, but they are kind of interesting and they may have some effects and we'll, we'll see. First of all, we should remember just thinking back that Sidney Powell's, you remember her Kraken lawsuits? Uh, those have <laughs> absolutely like jettisoned from a Michigan federal court and from a uh, Georgia federal court, the Michigan court was an Obama judge. The Georgia court, I believe, was a Bush, a George W. Bush appointee, uh, if we're keeping track. And they just took the Kraken and threw the Kraken out. So it was kind of the Perseus judges. Uh, now, remember, Sid, what Sidney Powell said is we're just going through the the ceremony of taking it to the lower courts. What we're really doing is heading for the Supreme Court. Let us even see if they go to the Supreme Court. I will bet. Uh, well, I won't bet, but I think there's a strong possibility that they won't. But there are suits that are interesting. Uh, Senator Cruz uh, yesterday said that he would, this is the one I keep talking about. This is the one about Pennsylvania, where I thought that there is an argument to be made. Uh, Ted Cruz says that he will argue it before the Supreme Court, if the Supreme Court will accept it. This is the one where what they have said is that uh, Pennsylvania lawmakers improperly expanded voting by mail in the state with a vote in the state legislature instead of submitting the change through the constitutional amendment process, which would have required a statewide ballot question, among other procedural steps. That is their argument. So in other words, that they change the rules without following their own rules for changing the rules. And there's been some glimmer of hope that the Supreme Court would hear this because Justice Alito moved the deadline up to today, pointing out that it had to be decided, if it was going to be decided, it had to be decided before Safe Harbor Day. And that's why he moved it up. And that gave uh, people on the Trump side uh, hope that they would hear it. I keep saying that I don't think they will hear it because even if it's true, and I think it is true, I think they did do something wrong and something unconstitutional. I think even if it's true, it won't change the outcome. And so the Supreme Court, this may be happening as I speak. I mean, they're going to decide this probably today, or at least if they don't come back today, uh, they may just not respond at all. <clears throat> but they may. There, there's always a chance. And it would be interesting to see uh, Senator Cruz, who has made Supreme Court arguments before, be interested to see him take that before them. Uh, and as I say, again, it's a, a legit argument. So it actually is kind of interesting. <clears throat> but if it won't change the outcome of the election, they probably won't do it. Because remember, he'll, he would need three others. Then Texas today, I think it was maybe yesterday, it was just around the corner. Texas uh, filed a lawsuit uh, against four other states, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Wisconsin and Michigan, uh, saying that their election results should be declared constitutional. That is a Hail Mary pass. But they argue that those states use the coronavirus pandemic, a very similar argument, uh, as an excuse to unlawfully change their election rules. Uh, through executive fiat or friendly lawsuits, thereby weakening ballot integrity. Uh, <clears throat> that's not going anywhere. Uh, but there's one, there is one interesting lawsuit, and I take this from Andrew McCarthy over at National Review. And the reason I take it from Andy McCarthy is because he has been a gold standard in following all legal questions, but even this. He's a guy who um, doesn't, doesn't like Trump particularly, but has sided with him and has really supported him in what the things that he de did that were good. Uh, and he's been following this one lawsuit saying that there are uh, about 140,000 illegal votes uh, in, the Georgia, uh, in the Georgia election. 
And the reason he's interested in this one is he says it's a, it's much better put together. He says the 64-page complaint is a linear, cogently presented description of numerous election law violations, apparently based on hard data. If you're looking in on Twitter, you're seeing this claim that there were so many illegals and so many convicts and so many dead people who voted. Uh, and they've made a very stringent, you know, very tight argument. McCarthy is not um, basically... He's not saying that they have the goods. He's not saying that they have the evidence. He's saying that they've made the argument very clearly, uh, as opposed to Sidney Powell, who really was just throwing stuff at the at the wall to see if it would stick. There again, uh, it's you know it's just unlikely because even if you overturned, you know, to say these. To say these votes are illegal is not to say that they're all for Biden. They're probably mostly for Biden. So they might turn the election around. Even so, they might, even if they turn the election around in Georgia, not going to turn the entire election around. He would need two more states to do that. So it's, again, unlikely the court is going to accept these things. So that's where we are. And Trump has been hammering uh, the people in Georgia He's been saying that, uh, you know, the secretary of state, Brad Raffensperger, uh, will will be solely responsible for the potential loss of our two great senators. Uh, and Kelly Loeffler, you know, won't call a special sex session or check for signature verification. By the way, on Twitter, on my Twitter feed, dozens of these Dem bots are saying, yes, Ben Shapiro is right. We shouldn't vote for Republicans in Georgia. Of course, Ben is not saying anything like that. So these are all Democrat operatives. So that's where this that's where the state of things is. So last night I had this conversation with my wife where she keeps asking me what I want for Christmas. And the answer is, I don't know. But you know what would be a great gift if I didn't already have them? Raycon. Raycon. I always want, every time I say Raycon, I always want to say Raycon because when you turn them on, they are wireless earbuds. And when you turn them on, they sing that little song. They go Raycon and they're just great. They really are terrific. I use them all the time. I, when I walk, I'm always listening to an audible book or when I hike, I'm listening to an audible book. There's a lot of wind out there and these things have noise suppressing uh, design. So you don't hear the wind so badly and you can hear what's going on on the story, which is what I want to hear. They are, they look good. They don't look like an insect as you wear them. The audio quality is amazing, uh, comparable to what you get from any other uh, premium brand, except Raycons start at half the price. Raycon is being generous for the holidays. So on top of their everyday great prices, they're offering my listeners 15% off. Go to buyraycon.com slash Clavin today to get 15% off your Raycon order. That's buy, B-U-Y, Raycon.com slash Clavin, buy, Raycon.com slash Clavin. And I know anyone can spell buy, but how? Please tell you how. How do I tell you? The, how do you spell Clavin? That's what you want to know. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. <laughs> there are no, <laughs> no I just make it look this incredibly easy. Now, I want to play for you, you know, like because, um, because Trump is going after these guys in Georgia on CBS they interviewed the lieutenant governor, Jeff Duncan, who Trump has attacked because they're not reversing the decision. And they're not going to reverse the decision. That's, it's just not going to happen. And if it does on the basis of this lawsuit, it would be a, a lightning bolt, but it still wouldn't change the outcome of the, the election. But I want you to listen how, to how Tony Ducoupel, a CBS morning anchorman, interviews uh, the the lieutenant governor of Georgia. These are cuts of his questions that he asked them. This is cut one. Do you regret not speaking up when the president was attacking others in this way, endangering their safety? Do you wish you had done something sooner so that you and your colleagues were not in this situation now? Well, I'm not certain of the basis of your question. I've been. I'll tell you the basis. I'll, I'll tell you the basis, Mr. Lieutenant Governor. The president attacks dozens of people a year on Twitter, and in many cases, mayors, governors, senators, members of Congress, everyday citizens, members of the news media. They then need security because the president has stirred up his supporters and kind of sick them on them. That's the basis of my question. Republicans did not speak up over four years of this happening. Now it's happening to Republicans. Do you regret? Now that you've seen what it, what it feels like, not speaking up sooner. That's the basis. Do you regret, um, sorry, Gail, I just, if you're saying it's not American and this is a person you voted for twice, President Trump, he's stirring this up. Do you regret that vote? So this is part of this delusion that our press and the Democrats are going through right now, that they have somehow behaved well and that the Trump people and those who are following the Trump people are behaving badly in some kind of unprecedented way. And 
this is what I mean when I say that the press has been exposed. These guys are are basically, you know, these guys are like that guy, I can't remember his name, who had his pants off during a Zoom meeting. He got thrown off uh, the New Yorker and he got thrown out of CNN. Jeffrey Tubin, thank you very much, who was playing with himself on it. That's what these guys are doing. They think we don't see that they're not wearing pants. They think that we don't see this. Michelle Goldberg, let's take a, a little stroll, because if you want to see how the left is operating, all you have to do is take a stroll over to Knucklehead Row, the op-ed page of the New York Times. Oh, hey, hey. So Michelle Goldberg, one of the chief knuckleheads, a true knucklehead on Knucklehead Row, has a column today called No One Expects Civility from Republicans. <laughs> I, love, I love this. It's like, you know, this, this whole thing about civility was invented by Bill Clinton to answer Rush Limbaugh because after 20 years, 30 years of calling every Republican a racist, 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 I disagree, you're a racist. I don't think that's a good policy. You're a racist. Whatever we said, you're a racist, you're a racist, you're a racist, you're sexist, you're a homophobe, you're a racist. And did I tell you you're sexist, homophobe, racist? Rush Limbaugh came out and started calling people names, too. He started saying, like, you know, uh, uh, feminazis. He started calling women femi feminist feminazis and things like this. And Bill Clinton was suddenly, well, we need more civility in our dialogue. You know, it's because <laughs> civility for me, but not for thee. So Michelle Goldberg says no one expects civility from Republicans, those Hitlerian racists. She says, perhaps you remember the terrible ordeal, Sark, suffered by the White House press secretary, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, at the Red Hand in 2018. She was awaiting her entree at the Virginia Farm to Table restaurant when the co-owner, appalled by Sanders' defense of Donald Trump's administration, asked her to leave. She was hounded out of the restaurant. Mitch McConnell also hounded on the street. This happened three days after the Homeland Security Secretary at the time, Kirsten Nielsen, was yelled at for the administration's family separation policy as she tried to dine at a Mexican restaurant in Washington. She was surrounded by a mob. These two insults launched a thousand thumbsuckers about civility. It's thumbsucking when we want it. More than one conservative writer warned liberals that the refusal to let Trump officials eat in peace could lead to Trump's reelection. The political question of the moment, opined Daniel Henninger in the Wall Street Journal, is this, can the Democratic Party control its left? Somehow, though, few are asking the same question of Republicans as Trump devotees terrorize election workers and state officials over the president's relentless lies about voter fraud. Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson described her family's experience this past weekend as my four-year-old son and I were finishing up decorating the house for Christmas on Saturday night, and he was about to sit down and to watch how the Grinch stole Christmas. Dozens of armed individuals stood outside my home shouting obscenities and chanting into bullhorns in the dark of night. Now, by the way, I disapprove of this action. I disapprove of hounding people in their homes. The idea that Michelle Goldberg doesn't know that this is what the left has been doing to conservatives and Republicans and others all this time for four years, never mind Sarah Sanders and never mind Mitch McConnell and never mind those people, ordinary people have been terrorized. And, the, and when she looks around, she's working at the New York Times, which used to be a newspaper, but now has this. I just went back to look at how they covered um, the Russian collusion hoax, this fantasy that they had that the Russians had done something by spending a couple of bucks on Facebook had somehow hacked our election. They used to say hacked our election because they wanted us to think they were inside our computers. They hacked our election. The plot to subvert an election, wrote the New York Times in a massive, massive essay. The plot to subvert an election, unraveling the Russia story so far, to travel back to 2016 and trace the major plot lines of the Russian attack is the Russian attack is to underscore what we now know with certainty the Russians carried out a landmark intervention that will be examined for decades to come to come. It's not, nobody's even talking about it anymore. They didn't even remember it wasn't even an election issue, but it will be examined for decades to come, acting on the personal animus of Mr. Putin. Public and private instruments of Russian power moved with daring and skill to harness the currents of American politics. Well-connected Russians worked aggressively to recruit or influence people inside the Trump campaign. To many Americans, the intervention seemed, to many Americans, listen to this, to many Americans, the intervention seemed to be a surprise 
surprise attack, a stealth cyber age Pearl Harbor carried out by an inexplicably sinister Russia. For Mr. Putin, however, it was a long overdue payback, and there is a plausible case that Mr. Putin succeeded in delivering the presidency to his admirer, Mr. Trump, though it cannot be proved or disproved. That's the way they covered Donald Trump's election. That is a cyber Pearl Harbor. So many people were thinking, we were all sitting around thinking, oh yeah, it's like Pearl Harbor. Unbelievable. That's the way they covered it. And they, and for four years, these people have been rioting in our streets. They took a one-time deal where George Floyd was killed by bad policing, and they turned it into a an epidemic of police killings of black people that simply does not exist. They turned this into an excuse to riot, to loot our cities, to keep us in perpetual terror and violence, all of which has vanished with the election results coming in. So they talk about civility. They have torn our country to pieces. And now they're telling us about civility. And in LA, a George Soros back, this is part of his project, is to put DAs in place, district attorneys in place, who will not prosecute crime, prosecutors who will not prosecute. So now he's got this guy, George Gascon. He even sounds like a, a, a cartoon villain who has announced sweeping policy changes as he took office as the Los Angeles County District Attorney, including a plan to end the use of cash bail, which means you're arrested and you're released, catch and released, the dramatic reversals to deeply ingrained traditional law enforcement strategies in the nation largest prosecutor's office also include plans to review thousands of old cases, which means letting criminals out. He expects to bring an end to misdemeanor prosecutions, which means if you are robbed, you will not be able to call the cops. This city is going to, only the Democrats could turn paradise into hell. Only the Democrats could do it. This city is going to be unlivable. I do not know the future, but I can tell you if I'm alive in six months, I will not be living here. This is, they have turned this city into hell hell and they're making it worse. So they're the ones who've done this all this time. They've done this all this time, T tortured us, terrorized us, uh, gaslit us by telling us it wasn't happening. These riots, they were mostly peaceful, these riots. It was just your store that happened to be destroyed. It was just your store that happened to be looted seven times in three days. You know, it, it, this, this is what they have done to us all these, this time. And all I'm saying to us as the good guys, since we're the good guys, is we have to use the novelist trick of looking back and thinking how we felt about this and how we felt about them and making sure while we fight our corner, which is very important, that we don't become them. It's important that we clean up this mail-in vote mess. It, it's a mess and it is a, an absolute invitation to fraud. That's important. It's also important that we win Georgia. <laughs> Donald Trump is not going to be president on January 20th. That, that is not a crisis. That's just the thing that happens in politics. You lose some, you win some. That's the way it goes. But we have to make sure the crisis is them. The crisis is the media. The crisis is the politicians doing what they do. That is the problem. As an insane right winger, one of the things I'm always worried about is that the government is going to lock me in my house and I won't be able to get to the food I need. Oh, wait, that's actually happening. So maybe I'm not an insane right winger. But ReadyWise can help you out. ReadyWise has emergency meals that will stay fresh for a long time. They also have freeze-dried fruits and vegetables for convenient on-the-go nutrition and new adventure meals for hiking, camping, and other outdoor activities if you don't live in L.A. and are allowed to go outside. ReadyWise makes being prepared simple and affordable. Order online and have nutritious meals shipped directly to your doorstep. Due to increased demand, supplies are limited and some items may currently be out of stock. Stock. But when government resources are strained, it can be days, if not weeks, before fresh food is available. Don't put yourself in a situation where you need food during an emergency. Prepare today with ReadyWise. And this week, my listeners can get free shipping at ReadyWise.com when entering Clavin at checkout or by calling 855-474-4084. ReadyWise has a 90-day, no questions asked return policy, so there's no risk taking the initiative to get yourself and your family prepared today. That's ReadyWise, R-E-A-D-Y, W. WISE.com, promo code CLAVEN to get free shipping. Don't wait for an emergency because you might not remember how to spell CLAVEN. Just keep repeating to yourself. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. Now, you may have noticed during some of this uh, conversation we've been having, you may have noticed that I have been drinking out of this absolutely solid gold. It's solid gold coated with obsidian, lined with diamonds. 
uh, and basically platinum underneath. It has this platinum thing underneath. None of this is true, uh, but this is the new Leftist Tears tumbler. It is beautiful, and the most important thing is not the diamonds, not the uh, platinum, not the gold encrusted with obsidian. It's not any of that stuff because none of that exists. What it is important is you can actually put it in the dishwasher uh, so you don't have to say, honey, have you washed my Leftist Tears tumbler? Because I know that's a, that's a pain in the neck. So, <laughs> so, so this is the new improved Leftist Tears tumbler. It, you can keep your Leftist Tears hot or cold. It's a new stainless steel design with a custom daily wire lid, which I'm not using right at this moment because I like to get a good, a good sip of my Leftist Tears. If you are not already a daily wire member, now is the time to join because not only will we give you a Leftist Tears tumbler, we have got some amazing stuff coming down the pike. We have the Michael Knowles show is now five days a week, adding more content for our members to enjoy. And I keep making the joke that if you take a top membership, you only have to listen to them three days a week. But that's not true. You don't have to listen to them at all. We're adding the entire Breaker You catalog to dailywire.com by the end of the year. Uh, Candace Owens is going to have a show with us. Uh, we've got already uh, launching our first feature film under the Daily Wire's upcoming entertainment channel. Hope to be doing a lot more about that. We're building a new investigative journalism team. This is the place to be for the new world. This is where we're dealing with the stuff that needs to be deal dealt with. The culture, the news business, information. We are we. The one thing that is a crisis right now is we cannot get good information. That is a problem. And if it gets worse, it will only get worse in, in favor of socialism and the left. We want to stop that. We're working on it here. Help us out. Go outside the narrative. Come over to dailywire.com slash subscribe. We're loud. We're opinionated. We're having a good time. And Tomorrow is the mailbag when all your problems will be solved. You know, the pandemic is a good example of this. Any, almost anybody would call the pandemic a crisis, but is it really? You know, the, a crisis is something that is going to change everything unless you do something about it, assuming you can do something about it. And I'm not sure we've done anything about the pandemic. I'm not sure any single person has done anything except, except for the vaccine, except for Donald Trump uh, helping with the vaccine. But the pandemic was bad at first, got better during the summer, and now is back during flu season when all these things get worse. Has anything anybody done had any effect on the numbers? I don't think so. I don't think anything, you know, they went, they said to Sweden, uh, you know, Sweden did that thing where they had voluntary uh, Took, told people to take voluntary steps. Now they're saying, well, that didn't work, so we have a lockdown. But the rest of Europe had lockdowns, and they didn't do anything either. And they had the same kinds of numbers. So I don't see what the difference is. It seems to me the flu is acting, the virus is acting just like a virus. The good news is they have now uh, delivered the first vaccine uh, from Pfizer in England. Uh, they gave it, it's an American vaccine. It was developed by Trump under his uh, Operation Warp Speed program, but England got it first. And so the New York Times and other leftist uh, outlets are saying, oh, the National Health Service delivered before America did. Well, that's true because the National Health Service can also decide you don't get anything and you die if you're too old, but they did, they can get through, uh, cut through regulations the way we can't because we have the FDA, which is a, a you know, Bureaucracy. The point of the of the bureaucracy is to slow processes down. That is why you have a bureaucracy. It's to slow processes down and check them. And we do want the FDA to check the safety of uh, medicines, especially with a vaccine where people are suspicious and they want to make sure it's it's good. But you know, the FDA can also sit on its hands when it shouldn't be and not allow people to experiment when they have a a um, medicine that's going to help people who have a fatal disease and so forth like that. So, so again, uh, yes, the National Health Service was able to bring an American vaccine to Britain faster than the FDA would let it come out to America. But that has nothing to do with the fact that the National Health Service can also let you die. And they do let people die. Basically, they do deny care uh, because they have to. You have, if you have national health care, you have to ration the health care and there has to be a death committee uh, to decide who's going to die and who's not. However, they did give the first one to a 90 year old and the second one, the first man to get it was named William Shakespeare. Uh, so I called that the taming of the flu, which, <laughs> no, never mind. Uh, Daniel, Daniel Hannon, who is, he's one of the, uh, he's a British uh, former European MP. He, he really knows his Shakespeare. He immediately rattled off a bunch of Shakespeare quotes, uh, but uh, I, I thought the taming of the flu was all right. Uh, President Trump, meanwhile, is going to issue an executive order today proclaiming that other nations will not get U.S. supplies of its vaccines until Americans have been inoculated, which is a very important uh, directive, uh, even though, of course, uh, Joe Biden can throw 
throw it away, at least you will have to throw it away and say, no, we're giving this to other countries before we give it to Americans, if that's what he plans to do. There are people on his, uh, in his cabinet who would like to do that. Hopefully, they're not that, uh, they're not that stupid. And here, again, because of the left's uh, complete seclusion within their own media, because of the arrogance and insularity of their governors, uh, we, the crisis that we have is the lockdown. The crisis that we have is the destruction of the economy, the destruction of people's lives without any evidence that has done a single thing to help mitigate this, this virus. The idea that w- there were going to be 15 days to slow the spread so that hospitals could take care of it didn't do anything. They never opened up again. They kept us under lockdown for as long as they could until it went away in the summer. And now it's back for the winter and it's going to be back for the winter until they get the vaccine out, which is what they should be thinking about. And, and people don't, you know, people don't believe anything. And the crisis is a crisis of information. That is the, the only crisis that this country is really in right now. And the crisis of stupidity. It's basically, basically it's the politicians and the press who are the crisis. They are the crisis. If we could solve that, we wouldn't have any other crisis except maybe the debt. Alex Berenson is a guy who used to work for the New York Times and then became kind of persona non grata because he started saying, you know, a lot of this information about the the virus is not true. And he writes in the Wall Street Journal today, he says, since June, Amazon has twice tried to suppress self-published booklets I have written about COVID-19 and the response to it. These booklets don't contain conspiracy theories like the scientists who wrote the Great Barrington Declaration. I simply believe many measures to control the coronavirus have been damaging, counterproductive, and unsupported by science. Amazon is censoring his stuff. Google owned YouTube censors uh, even more aggressively. The company disclosed in October that it had pulled more than 200,000 videos about the epidemic, including one from Scott Atlas, a physician who was advising President Trump. Facebook has not only censored videos and attached warning labels or fact checks to news articles, but removed groups that oppose lockdowns and other restrictions. And the thing is, this is the problem. This is the problem because who are they listening to? They're not, you know, are they scientists? Is, is Jack Boots Dorsey over at Twitter a scientist? Scientists know. And is he listening to scientists? No. He's listening to reports about science and he's listening to one set of scientists over another because those scientists fit in with his emotional connections, just like we were talking about. This is what novelists know. What novelists know is that Jack Dorsey is making decisions emotionally that he thinks are scientific. And that's what we don't want to do. We do not want to join the gang. Here is Anthony Fauci, you know, Anthony Fauci is just amazing. Uh, who wrote about this? Joy Pullman in The Federalist. She wrote about the fact that Anthony Fauci criticized the British for saying, for allowing the vaccine to be released so quickly. And then when he was challenged on that and he realized he had stepped on the National Health Service, he had stepped on socialized medicine, he said, no, 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 it wasn't bad that they did it. But if we had done it, it would have been bad. That's, what he, that's basically what Fauci said. Here he is uh, trying to kill Christmas. This is cut nine. My concerns, John, are the same thing of the concerns that I had about Thanksgiving, only this may be even more compounded because it's a longer holiday. With Thanksgiving, you know, it was just the end of the week and then you go back to work the next week. With Christmas, it starts several days before. It goes through Christmas, the week after Christmas, into New Year's and the New Year's holiday. I think it could be even more of a challenge than what we saw with Thanksgiving. So I hope that people realize that and and understand that as difficult as this is, nobody wants to modify, if not essentially shut down their holiday season. But we are in a very critical time in this country right now. We've got to not walk away from the facts and the data. This is tough going for all of us. Nobody ever says to this guy, why should anybody listen to you when you've changed your mind, when nobody's got a consistent message, when nobody is passing consistent rules, when the people who pass the rules break them? Nobody has said anything about this. One of another guy on Trump's team, Admiral Gerar, I think his name is pronounced Gerar, probably Gerar. He comes out and he says, you know, there actually is no reason to shut down outdoor dining. The science doesn't support that. This is cut two. What really breaks my heart is that um, I don't know of any data that says you need to shut down outdoor dining or outdoor bars. Uh, We really wanted to limit the indoor crowded places. The evidence uh, clearly uh, does not support limitations on things like outdoor dining, particularly that are spaced outdoor uh, bars. Um, You know, the evidence just isn't there. And remember, shutting down completely, um, particularly if you don't have evidence, can be counterproductive. 
<laughs> so, you know, it's a little hard for us to know who to trust, especially with the media lying and censoring people. When the media lies and censors people, you immediately get your back up and you immediately say, well, if you're going to shut this guy down, maybe he's telling the truth. Why aren't you letting him speak? Why can't we compare uh, information from people? And because the media is now a completely untrustworthy a vehicle for information. The news media is completely untrustworthy. The New York Times is untrustworthy. You just heard me read from the New York Times Russian collusion story, a complete fantasy uh, re related as news. The networks are untrustworthy. You just heard CBS browbeating a, a public official for supporting Donald Trump when they never browbeat uh, Democrats. They never said to Adam Schiff, hey, didn't you act kind of like Joseph McCarthy here? Nobody ever said that to him. Why should we trust anything they say? So now in Minnesota, where you have urban ur Uber Sturmfuhrer uh, Gretchen Whitmer setting thing, shutting things down by pure fiat, you know, as she marches back and forth on the balcony in her epaulets, giving the salute. Uh, and here are some bit bar owners in Minnesota just saying, you know, we're not going to do this. this is cup three. A governor cannot shut down businesses at a whim. He cannot pick and choose who's going to be a winner, who's essential and who's not essential, because that's basically what he did. He said that we are not essentials. All Americans are essential to me. And for him to pick and say that my business is not essential and that we have to shut down. I have two businesses. I have a gymnastics gym and a restaurant, and I have to shut down both businesses because he thinks we're not essential. And for me, I'm not going to back down to tyranny. I'm sorry. I said that that was Michigan. They, those guys for, from Minnesota. So we have to let Urban Sturmfuhrer Gretchen Whitmer uh, off the hook and she can go on matching back and forth on the balcony in her epaulets. So I, I apologize for confusing Minnesota and Michigan. But the same, but the point remains, of course, is that it's, it's random. Uh, it is uh, hi hypocritical. They don't follow the rules. I want to end just this with uh, Pete Davidson. I started with celebrities. I want to end with a celebrity. Is Pete Davidson, the comedian from Saturday Night Live, picking on people for trying to keep their businesses open. This is cut six. I saw uh, the protest. People were outside the bar shouting about freedom, taunting the cops, chanting that they should arrest the governor. But it's Staten Island, so I assumed that it was just like a typical last call. <laughs> And are you against these protests? I mean, kind of, but I'm also just happy I'm no longer the first thing people think of when they say, what's the worst thing about Staten Island? I take it that you found these protests frustrating. <laughs> yeah, man, they're making us look like babies. You know, you know, it's bad when even people in Boston are like, ah, drink at home, you queers. So, you know, there's a guy at work making good money, making fun of working class people for not being able to go to work. Pete Davidson uh, is, by his own uh, by his own admission, is a um, he, he's a mentally ill guy. I mean, if you watch his comedy, it's not funny. If you watch his stand up, it's not funny. It's actually the ranting of a guy with a mental disorder, uh, and I, I will stand by that. He himself has just said he's got a mental disorder, so I'm not uh, saying anything that's a secret. So why is he even talking to us about this? But the point is, it's again these these sequestered people living in this bubble world that is created by the media. They live inside the media. They can do their work at home on their computers, and they're making fun of people who are strug really struggling, going broke. For what? For what? There is no evidence, as far as I can see, there's no evidence that anything these people have done has had one single effect on what is, after all, a disease. Get the vaccine out. People should take care. We should all be aware that we have to save the Claven because if I'm not here, you're all existing in my imagination. When I go, you go with me. So you don't want that to happen. But still, still, it's just a little bit of common sense and sanity and truth telling would be, go a long way, would go a long way in a community, that, in a country that is suffering from no real crisis except the crisis of governorship, of government, and the crisis of the media. Those are the crises we're in. I just want to take a pause and plug my pal uh, Michael Walsh's new book, Last Stands, Why Men Fight When All is Lost. It's doing really well on Amazon. He's a good writer, Michael. And uh, if you have that, can't get that pop singer, remember that pop singer who was in a dress on the cover of some stupid magazine? Uh, if you can't get that image out of your head and you want to think about real men uh, fighting real battles, Last Stands by Michael Walsh, Why Men Fight When All is Lost. Tomorrow... 
is the mailbag. Did I say that enough times? It is the mailbag. That means you can ask me any question you want about your personal life, about religion, about politics, and all the answers will be 100% guaranteed correct and will change your life. And whether they will change your life for the better or not is something that you can just wait in suspense to find out. It could be just a tremendous car wreck, and that would be kind of cool. We'll be here to answer all your questions on The Andrew Clavin Show. I am Andrew Clavin. The Andrew Clavin Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Assistant director, Pavel Wadowski. Edited by Adam Saivitz and Danny D'Amico. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup, or head and makeup, is by Nika Geneva. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants, McKenna Waters and Ryan Love. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2020. If you prefer facts over feelings, aren't offended by the brutal truth, and you can still laugh at the insanity filling our national news cycle, well, tune in to The Ben Shapiro Show. We'll get a whole lot of that and much more. See you there.